Our guest today saw a problem, so she decided to become part of the solution. Dr. Courtney Pullman Turner commissioned in the United States Navy right out of undergrad. During her time as a junior officer, she experienced her own mental health struggles and had a difficult time feeling understood by her mental health provider. When she came off active duty and went into the reserves, she enrolled in a master's program to get her degree in counseling. She enjoyed what she was learning, but wanted to go deeper, so she transferred into the doctoral program instead. After earning her doctorate, she came back to active duty in order to utilize her prior shipboard and deployed experiences in combination with her education and bring a new kind of mental health care to active duty members. She is board certified in clinical psychology with the American Board of Professional Psychology and has nine years of experience providing mental health care to service members and their beneficiaries. She treats a variety of conditions and clinical concerns, including anxiety, depression, grief, and adjustment disorders, but treating trauma is one of her passions. Her favorite patients, as she calls them, are the salty dudes, and I couldn't agree with her more. These are the rough and tumble men we see that aren't allowed to show their emotions or have feelings. Courtney is grateful to be able to provide a space for these individuals to process and heal. She believes that the most meaningful piece of her work is that people come into her office and share with her what feels like the most shameful thing for them. She knows that this process requires a lot of trust in order to help them walk this healing path so that they can get their quality of life back, which was lost through their past experiences. Today, you'll get to hear from Courtney and her incredible insight into healing from trauma. I give you Dr. Courtney Pullman Turner. Welcome to the Danielle Shea podcast. My name is Danielle Shea. I'm your host and a healing coach for sexual abuse survivors. I support survivors all around the world to live a joyful and fulfilled life despite their past traumas and experiences. In this podcast, we have real and raw conversations about what it means to heal from sexual trauma. When you listen to this show, know that you are loved, you are believed, and that I strive to provide the most valuable healing tools that are working in real time with my clients right now. In this episode, we have a guest that is going to provide massive value with an open heart and an open mind. I encourage you to listen to this episode with the same mentality. Please know that these are adults having adult conversations. These conversations are real and raw. This episode may be triggering in its content, stories shared, and the language used. Please listen with headphones and in a space where you feel safe. Thank you for choosing yourself and being willing to heal because we need you in this world. Take a nice deep breath. And let's jump into today's conversation. Great to be chatting with you, Danielle. I'm very excited to have you. Um, For all of you listening, Courtney and I, Dr. Courtney, um, and I know each other because we do martial arts together. So we met through the beautiful world of Kung Fu and um, she moved away sad face. We're all crying about it, but uh, she gets to come and visit quite a lot. Um, And so I'm just really excited to have you on the show and to be discussing all of the things that we've talked about many, many times offline. And now we get to bring it and our friendship to the audience here. So thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited. Yay. So if you could, um, I just would love for you to start off um, with just like two to three sentences. Who are you? Um, And what are you excited to chat about today? You 100% prepared me for this. And I did not 100% prepare me for this. Um, (laughs) So um, I would love to be more creative than this, but I'm going to fall back on titles right now because that it feels more accessible to me. Um, so I am a, a clinical psychologist um, in the Navy. Nothing I say today is DOD endorsed. This, these are my personal professional experiences. Um, and that is a big part of who I am, but I also have a multitude of other things that I enjoy doing like martial arts. Um, and I'm a wife and I'm a dog mom. Um, and I am an inadvertent advocate. I think I end up being just because I 
hear something and I don't have the ability to necessarily just walk away. Yeah, definitely. And I love that you kind of just colored that for us in a way that was like, Hey, I am not just my title, but here are all these other things. And one of the things that I do with my clients and in my masterclass is, you know, I tell them my story and then I show them like, and I'm a philanthropist and a dancer and a writer and a, and a coach and a girlfriend and a daughter and a dog mom and all these things because my trauma is not my identity and neither is yours. And so I really want my clients to hear the fact that they are so much more than their experiences. But I think also we get caught up in life of just being, we are, we are just our titles, whatever we dawn on. And I think that we can put on the title of trauma um, a lot as well. So I really appreciate the fact that you were able to be like, and I am all of these other things too. So do you see that when you're working with, with clients of their like very, they feel like they're stuck in this box of their experience. And if so, how do you help them kind of get out of that box? So I, I see that a lot just with, with all my patients in general, like not even just the trauma patients. Um, I usually start off early on. So if somebody's coming to me most of the time, by the time they've gotten to me, because we have so many other resources they can utilize, they're in a fair bit of distress. Um, and nobody else has been able to adequately help them up to this point. So the ball's passed to me. Um, and one of the things I'm going to do immediately is start working on the low hanging fruit. So how can we empower this person a little bit, give them a little bit of their hope back before we dive into like whatever it is they need to explore further in therapy. And one of the things I often talk about with them is diversity of identity. And I, um, I mean, I can look back on my own experience where like my role as a student was, I was what I identified as. And so if that wasn't going well, I wasn't doing okay. And my, if my role as a Naval officer wasn't going well, um, or if something was going wrong in my relationship, um, it's like I had so few ways of defining who I was that if any one of those went poorly at any given time, it then just made me have this sort of bad self image of my entire being. Um, and so I talk to people about having all of these different elements of themselves, even different interests, right? Um, when you're struggling with mental health concerns, sometimes you need to, you know, knitting may not be what you enjoy, but maybe that's all you got in you right now, right? And so having these different things to draw on um, instead of just one or two things that define you and that's it. Um, and then with the trauma, yes. And actually that kind of gets into one of the things we will see a lot with PTSD, and I know this was kind of like down the list a little bit, but like the, the PTSD isn't necessarily forever. Um, and when I was in um, graduate school, we thought it was. Like, this is how recent this has been. So I've been out of grad school for, I don't know, like seven-ish, eight-ish years now, math and time is weird, um, but somewhere around there. And at one point I was teaching an undergrad class um, as like, a, a, like an, a TA. And I remember covering the section on trauma and we talked about how like, if you get PTSD, you have PTSD forever, that's it. And I think that was largely true for a long time because of the way uh, we didn't allow people to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so they had to hold in um, everything and like that contributes. I know we're going to talk a little bit later about men specifically, um, but I find that shame is a lot of kind of what keeps that weight on men. Um, and so we weren't really allowed to talk about these things. I say we, I actually am lucky enough to have come up in a generation where these things had started to change. Um, but we weren't allowed to talk about these things. We didn't know what we know now. We didn't have the research, either brain science or just research on effective therapy modalities. And the path is not linear and it's not the same for everybody. And, um, you know, what I tell people is I can't take your memories away. Hmm. I can't take away the bad things that happened to you. But what I can help you do is get back your quality of life. Hmm. And sometimes that means for some people, they have no symptoms anymore. 
for sometimes it means, or for sometimes, sometimes it means um, that their symptoms are significantly reduced or they find a way to manage them. Um, but, uh, but they're, they're learning how to, how to walk through the trauma in a way that lets them still go to a restaurant with their significant other, um, still be able to connect physically with someone, still be able to go to their kids' sporting events or see someone in concert that they really want to see or you know use, do things that they used to enjoy that maybe the trauma had put a halt to for some period of time. Mm. Um, and so... What we often see, and I, I've seen it a little bit less in the last few years, and I hope that is a product of people having a new understanding. Um, it could just be, you know, every time I'm, I move to a duty station, I'm getting a slightly different demographic. So that could be it. I don't know. But um, I'm, I, we would see a lot historically of people in mental health who get that diagnosis and they like become in their minds PTSD. Like this is now who they are. And um, it would get to the point it gets in the way with getting better, right? With like getting to a place where you're happy with your life again. Um, a lot of people would, I've seen people use it as kind of an excuse. Um, and I'll always be upfront too, when you start a trauma treatment, there is nothing easy about therapy and especially trauma-focused therapy. It is going to be, miserable at times <laughs> miserable right but like worth it but but also worth it <laughs> yes yes and that's the thing is it's like um I wish I wish I had this like super comfortable warm huggy like path through the trauma to healing but it's not it's gnarly right like I compare it to debrading a wound you know if you've ever scraped your knee on some gravel and you have to like clean all the dirt and gravel out like that is painful. And that is essentially what we're doing on an emotional level. And that sort of wearing the trauma as your identity. And I want to say trauma, not just PTSD, because um, sorry, my dog is coming to say hi. Hi, buddy. Um, because you don't have to have PTSD to suffer symptoms related to trauma. Um, but uh, to have that that trauma and, and people will kind of say, well, it's like, I I've skinned my knee, so I can't do these things. Mm -hmm. I can't go ride my bike. I can't, um, you know, put on long pants or whatever, you know? Um, and instead of saying I skinned my knee, I need to go address this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they'll just sort of walk around protecting the pain. Ooh, Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I have not had language for that, but that is so good. Cause I've done that 100% either using it as an, as an excuse because the excuse is easier or protecting the pain because who am I without this going mm -hmm. back to it being yeah. part of my identity. If I have PTSD or if I'm a survivor or if I'm, you know, whatever, and then I go out and start doing the healing one, the healing is scary, but two, doesn't that invalidate my experience or doesn't that, you know, make me make it not that big of a deal because now I'm healed from it. Like we think that by yeah, protecting the pain that that somehow is going to validate us, but then also keep us safe from other experiences as well. Yeah. And, you know, you mentioned uh, like, uh, since we're talking about identity too, um, a lot of people will come to me and say like, I just want to be who I was before. Mm. And it's so hard for me to break it to them, but that person isn't, gone. they're gone. Yeah. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't be somewhere, maybe even better, maybe not, but somewhere better than where you are now. Yeah. Um, and, and so the, yeah, I, holding I, on to it, the, it's that versus the unknown, right? Yeah. And that the unknown for everyone listening, terrifying, terrifying for anyone. Change is terrifying, but you just brought up something that's so important. And another thing that I do in my masterclass, which is when I'm telling my story, I tell people the person I was before my trauma is dead. She's gone. She doesn't exist anymore. But the person I am now or the person that I was going through my trauma, she's also gone. She doesn't exist anymore either. The person I am now is so vastly different. 
but that also tells me that the person I'm going to be in five years is not going to be this person. So whether I have, you know, even if life just is sunshine and rainbows for the rest of my life forever and ever, amen, I'm still going to be changing and I'm still going to be growing. And so the trauma doesn't have to be the thing that is the only reason why that past self or past version of you is gone. And yeah, looking at that possibility of who else do I get to become in spite of this or because of this, you know, whatever language makes you feel more empowered. But I just wanted to highlight what you said right there is you're absolutely right. And it's so hard to hear, but yes, that person is gone. The person you were before your trauma doesn't exist anymore. Just like the people that we all were before COVID, they don't exist anymore. People kept saying, I want the world to go back to normal. And I'm like, why? Like, why can't we create a new version of what that means? Because there's parts of pre-COVID that I don't want to go back to. Yeah. You know? And so like, what does that mean? How can we change and grow and evolve in a positive way? And then the trauma or that event was was the reason that that changed, but it still can be, be positive. So I just got really excited about that. Continue. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't remember where that thread started. Um, I think, Oh, identity. Yeah. Identity, so, yeah. so that's kind of where I see people, the identity becomes an impediment to treatment. Um, and I, I have, like I said, I have not really in recent years, I don't think I've seen it in the last few years, which is great, you know, um, because that's a really hard wall to break through. The other one that's really tough is avoidance, which is a symptom of trauma, right? A symptom of PTSD. There are different ways we avoid the thing. It could be avoid thinking about it. It could be avoid feeling your feelings about it. It could be, I don't go into that store because it smells like this, which reminds me of this experience, whatever it is. Um, and so we're often, um, one of the things I do with people before we jump into treatment, because I know it's going to be hard is we, we talk about why they're here, like what it was in their life that they usually, by the time they've gotten to see me, they've been afraid of losing something. Mm -hmm. And so now this is sort of a like response, like my spouse is going to leave me if I don't do something about this, or I'm going to lose my job or, you know, whatever. Um, or like my drinking is going to get me in trouble. Um, and so we'll sit and kind of think about like, well, what motivated you to be here? Like, what do you want on the other side of this? Do you want to be able to go to your kids sporting events? Do you want to be able to be honest with your wife about your feelings? You know, whatever it is, um, so that they can look back at that when they're running into that wall of <clears throat> of resistance, which we know is part of, of trauma, but like, it's the one thing I need people to push through themselves so that I can walk with them through the other things. You know, like I, I don't have, I'm sure there are, there are services out there that do this. I do not have the ability to drive to my person's house and sit the worksheets in front of them and sit there and stare at them until they do them. Like they have to push through that, um, avoidance tendency themselves. Um, and I feel like holding on to the trauma as who you are is sort of like the ultimate avoidance because you're just saying there's nothing, there's nothing else. So I'm not even going to look for it. Yeah. Oof, that's so good. That's so good. You talked about a lot of really important things just in that whole identity. And I'd like to unpack some of them, but I think if we could, if we could maybe start unpacking things from maybe a, a male's lens or a male's perspective. And mm -hmm. the reason listeners that I really want to do this is because trauma does affect different people differently, but it also affects us differently due to the societal implications, due to the things that we're told that we can or cannot do and the way that we are supposed to quote unquote show up in society. And this specific type of trauma, sexual trauma, it doesn't really get discussed a lot of happening to men, happening to boys, happening to people who identify as men. Um, and so Dr. Courtney and I really enjoy this subject of just like, how do we support the dudes? And like, not just the dudes, but like, to to quote Dr. Pullman Turner, the salty dudes, <laughs> the people who come in with, 
you know, the most quote unquote macho iest of macho ness. And then how do we help them and support them to, to move through this work? And so that's how we're just kind of going to discuss this moving forward. And that's not to say that there aren't going to be like really beautiful nuggets for if you don't identify as man. Um, but I just want to give, give the men of the world some love here and know that, Hey, we believe you, we see you, we support you. We want you to get help. So one of the first things we could talk about is how do we unpack kind of that shame or that, you know, emotional insecurity of, of that why, and I I like why being there, because what I always tell my male clients is that I have female privilege, which means I can feel every other emotion except anger. I'm not allowed to feel angry. That's what society tells me. But as men, you are allowed to feel anger, period. That's it. You don't get anything else. And so there is a lot of this shame and a lot of this, like, well, I don't want to even touch the emotional stuff because they're told that they can't do that. So what is something that when they come to you, they finally come to you that you can, that you do to help support them through that thinking or through that initial kind of trauma work? Yeah. So the first step is really um, talking about it. Uh, and then I, I feel like I shouldn't be surprised at this point, but sometimes I still really am. I will have a man in their thirties or forties come to me and tell me that they are just closing the trauma to someone for the first time. Yeah. Um, and they're married. Maybe they've been married for a long time. Um, and I just, you know, I'm lucky enough to have the kind of relationship with my partner where where we are open and, and share things. Um, but if you're coming from a structure where, especially if the wife also or husband um, expects the this certain type of response from you, now you have to figure out how to break out of it yourself and also how to how to break them out of it. So finding spaces where they can talk about this stuff. Um, and that's often very hard. Sometimes it's initially only going to be with me, um, but I cannot replace your entire social support system. So um, we start looking for the least uncomfortable because I'm not going to say easy. I don't like saying easiest because none of them are easy. And I think that is not fair to them. The least uncomfortable space where they can share the amount of information that's least uncomfortable to share, but still moving toward not holding this inside in a dark space anymore. Because I I will tell my clients, my patients that like, if you treat something like it's shameful, you will feel the shame. We have to sort of bring it into the light uh, so that it doesn't get to just fester in that dark space anymore. Um, And it doesn't always go great either. That's always really hard. Um, and sometimes we have to look for, I mean, very well-meaning people, friends, family who very much love you can be absolutely horrendous at sitting with you through your emotions or even just hearing hard things, but that's them. That is a them problem. It's, it's still going to hurt you potentially. Um, and I have, you know, it's always hard when it doesn't go well. Um, but most of the time when they actually open up, like let's you, it's, it's most often it's husbands opening up to wives because that's more, they, you know, those are the people who are more likely to be in sort of the traditional, like male, female roles or what we think are traditional male, female, female roles in Western culture. Um, and the, the husband is almost always like, I don't want to put this on her. I don't want to burden her. Um, which is, I, I understand. Um, and I'm not saying like, you know, don't wait until she's at rock bottom and then dump, you know, dump all your darkest secrets on her. Um, but there's never going to be like a good time to tell them something hard, but you have to start, you have to start somewhere and you have to start talking about it. And so maybe it's just starting by saying I had a trauma. Maybe it's starting by saying I had a sexual trauma Um, and it's the sexual traumas are the ones that I really see the most shame with. Um, Not nearly as much with like, you know, I've also seen a fair amount of combat trauma um, or trauma from like medically related traumas. 
um, trauma patients, their story was kind of in line with those things, but it's the sexual trauma where people tend to keep it in that dark space. Um, and then that just makes them feel dirty. And so we have to just air it out. Um, and it's figuring out where to start for everybody. Right. Yeah. Um, and a lot of times just talking about it in a room with me is that is like the hardest thing they've ever done. So that's where we're starting. And then we start to, to, as we go through the treatment protocol, we'll start to explore other spaces where they might be able to be more authentic about their experiences. Yeah. Um, so I think that's the first part. And then also, um, I mean, I'm, I get pretty salty back with them. <laughs> like, I just don't let them get, they don't fluster me, right? And I think you have to find for men, um, and you know, every every therapist, every healing coach, whatever your role is, you have to be yourself, right? Um, but um, finding your own way of kind of not letting them shake you, you know, um, like military population, I hear a lot of swearing. I'll just speak in the same language they're speaking in, right? You're not gonna get me shaken up by doing that. I'm here to say like, I am on board with whatever it is you need to pull out and go through. Yeah. Um, and so kind of establishing that you're not gonna be like, Ugh! like if they, you know, go too far or too raw, I think is really, um, really important as well. I feel there's a lot of like the pushing away. So I think that's the best place to start. And then from there, and this is for anyone, um, but, um, Okay, before we get actually to the next thing, I want to pause you. Um, just because you said something really important um, about, you know, that kind of like therapy coaching relationship. And so those listening, if you are in that healing coach therapy counselor space, take that to heart as well. Um, and maybe brainstorm what are ways that you can do that for yourself and your patients and your clients. And then drivers. If you feel like you're getting that pushback from your therapist, from your counselor, from your healing coach, from whoever it is you're opening up to, please know that it's okay to choose somebody else if you have the ability to do so, right? Um, there are so many clients that I have that they kind of balk at me when I talk back to them and they go, I've never had somebody do that before. Thank you so much for being like, thank you for so much for calling me out on my BS. You're not going to let me get away with anything, are you? And I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm not here. I'm here to help you. I'm not here to, you know, keep help you brush things under the rug. Like, we're going to air all that out. And so I just want to, to let everybody know listening that the relationship that you have with this person that's going to help you unpack these things is really important. You need to feel safe in those things and you need to feel held accountable. And so I really just like what you pointed out about how like, yeah, I'm just going to use the same language that they, they need because that's building rapport, that's building care, that's building trust. And then from someone who's on the opposite end of the couch, right? Make sure that you feel comfortable in that space as well, because that's going to help you open up. And so I just don't feel like we talk about it enough where it's like the patient or the client is allowed to choose or allowed to choose yeah. again. And that's just and I very important. One thing I also emphasize um, too is, you know, you have to understand it takes, it's a relationship, yeah. you know, it is a relationship and just like any relationship, it takes time. Um, you're not going to walk in to one meeting and just be immediately a hundred percent comfortable talking about everything. Um, it's not going to happen. Uh, and then also it's okay for you to communicate that you're not getting what you need. Um, sometimes it's, it's not, it's sometimes a therapist or the coach will work with you in the way that works for you, but they need you to tell them that what they're currently doing is not it. Um, and, uh, a lot of people really don't feel comfortable doing that. Um, which, you know, I can understand, like, I have not always been comfortable with confrontation to the level I am now, but, um, you know, confrontation, I think gets a bad rap and any, Anybody who is a real professional um, can hear that and work 
can get feedback like that, like, hey, this isn't working for me and work with it, right? And sometimes it's because they don't understand what the point of the activity we're doing is. Or sometimes, um, you know, it's just logistically, it's hard for them to figure out how to get the worksheets in or whatever they're doing. Regardless, um, yeah, like speak up. You are, you are part of the treatment team. You are part of the team that decides how this moves forward. Um, so speak your mind, let them know if it's not working um, and give it a little bit of time unless somebody does something that just makes you feel outrageously uncomfortable. So you don't have to be hundred percent polite if somebody uh, has made you feel incredibly uncomfortable, even if they're a therapist, um, just you can tell them. I've had people have to end sessions before um, because we just get a nerve and sometimes they come back and sometimes they don't. And that's okay. Yep. That's okay. Um, so that was just expanding on what you said. Like, yeah. yes, hundred percent, you get to choose. And also you get a voice in that room. Yeah. And I just, I really like what you're saying too, that you get a voice and there's been so many conversations that I've had with, with men, you know, whether they're my clients or even they're my friends. Um, and I have to remind them that they do have a voice and they're allowed to speak up. And I think right now in the world in which we live in, we are really telling men to sit down and shut up and sit down, look pretty, right? Yeah. There's this kind of reversal that's happening and we don't need to get into all of that. But there are people, even before that conversation was like really heavy and happening, I'd be having these conversations with my male friends going, have you told your partner about that? And they go, well, no, I'm like, you know, that you're allowed to have feelings in this relationship too. And it's the first time that they've heard that. Or, you know, you know, you're allowed to tell them that you are also upset with them. Right. And one conversation that I personally have with my partner is I tell him just because my feelings are louder than yours doesn't mean that you don't have feelings and it doesn't mean that I don't want to hear them. I am just more practiced at talking about my feelings and I'm more practiced at talking about them very, very loudly because that's how I process. And so we have to have these conversations of just because mine are louder than yours doesn't mean yours aren't equally valid. And so I just love that you said that also in this, you know, therapeutic or coaching or whatever relationship, this healing relationship, that your voice matters as well and you're allowed to speak up in those things. And of course, this is true across all genders. Um, but I don't think that we give men permission to say you're allowed to, to ask for what you want when you have like the best intentions or when you're trying not to be too much. And, and I did want to like add on to that too. And you're talking about the partners. Um, so one thing that I emphasize is the importance. Now the therapeutic relationship is one space where it's a little bit different because we're not, you're not providing me support. If you're providing your therapist support, yeah. maybe look at it, get in a therapist. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but in all of our other relationships, um, healthy relationships have a give and a take right? Um, and so there's actually psychological research that shows if you are receiving, consistently receiving far more than you're giving in a relationship, it makes you feel uncomfortable. And so when we don't open up to our partners, we're denying them that opportunity and ourselves that opportunity to let that relationship grow. You're blowing my mind because <laughs> how like I can just feel how true that is and I can just call up instances for how true that is but that it's like scientifically proven is the thing that's blowing my mind that's crazy but yeah it makes so it much sense yeah and that doesn't mean that you're equally leaning on each other all the time mm. you know sometimes it may feel about equal sometimes like one person needs a little bit more support than the other and then vice versa. But over a long-term healthy relationship, it should kind of come out in the wash, right? Like it should be roughly even. Um, and a lot of, I think, I think now that I'm saying this too, um, 
I actually think that's why a lot of women feel a lack of connection in their relationships with men is because we're not being offered those opportunities. Um, because I can think about, I think back to like, you know, my husband didn't always just naturally open up in that way because that wasn't what he was taught either. And so he's, he's had to learn. Um, and the times when he started to open up and, and share something of vulnerability with me or times where our, we grew much closer. Um, and, um, yeah, like your, your relationship is going to stagnate without that anyway. So why, why carry that burden all by yourself? You know, that you've had this trauma. Yes. And then it just takes away, it comes, let me form a proper thought here. Um, because I'm just very excited about this conversation. Um, it also kind of takes away the, the notion of, well, am I a burden by bringing Mm -hmm. this up? It's like, well, in fact, your relationship potentially could grow and evolve and you could become stronger because you guys are working through adversity together in, in this way and, and opening up. And now, of course, as we're talking, we're talking about rational people and rational relationships that are not abusive and all of those things, right? Like putting context into how this can occur in a healthy way. Um, but yeah, what an interesting thought process to explore of, and this is actually something I recently had to explore in my own therapy of how is me believing that I'm a burden actually affecting the relationship? And what mm-hmm. if, in fact, I just showed up in the ways that felt burdensome and 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 saw what happened? And then, in fact, I was proven that, oh, I'm actually not a burden. And when I ask for help, people are very willing to support me in that way and often have been waiting to support me in that way as well. Just as other people that I've been in a relationship with, you know, whether that's romantically or platonically or, you know, mother, daughter, um, when they start asking for help, I go, oh, okay, finally, now now we can get somewhere. Yeah. So interesting. Okay. Before we went on this very important tangent, um, you were going to go into kind of the next step into that relationship, um, that therapeutic relationship, but also that, that healing journey. Yeah. So, um, I think the next step is really, um, so now this is speaking specifically about people. So I, I see people who are meeting the criteria for some type of trauma diagnosis that could be PTSD, or it could be, I call it diet PTSD. It's just, um, you know, for PTSD, you have to meet a certain number of these specific symptoms in each category. And then we also have a diagnosis, like other specified um, reactions to trauma, other specified trauma related disorder. I'm getting confused because the way the electronic medical record displays it is completely different than how it is in the DSM. But but it's it's kind of, I see a lot of people that go in that category um, that's like a catch-all for anyone. Like they have valid trauma symptoms. They don't, they're like interfering with their life to the, to the extent that I'm, I'm willing to say like, yeah, this is probably right now disordered. And um, they don't meet criteria for PTSD. And some people, I, I guess I'll just launch into this now because it just came up organically, but like some people feel really invalidated by that. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, like we don't have a blood test for PTSD. We don't have a blood test for depression, right? Um, We have a common language that we have kind of strung together so that we can communicate as medical providers. And then now it's really almost become more about billing insurance. In reality, diagnoses are just a thing we made up. Like we made it up so that we didn't have to be like, listing all the symptoms every time we wanted to explain the phenomenon, right? Um, and so um, I think figuring out, like helping people be okay with whether they where they are with that. Some people are really upset by any type of trauma diagnosis. And then some people are upset because they didn't get a PTSD diagnosis. Um, and so it's really interesting how it can go in like either direction. Um, and 
I don't actually talk about diagnoses a lot other than to say like, hey, I think you meet criteria for this. We know that this, these types of treatments are shown to work best for this. So that's what I would recommend. Um, and I, that's intentional because I don't, I don't think the diagnosis is really that important beyond informing the treatment. Like yeah. what's the way, yeah, what's the way ahead? Like, how do we heal? Um, and um, even that is not perfect. It just gives us like a better direction. Yeah. And so it then from the there- risk. And we'll color yeah. in what's gonna work. Yes, exactly. And then from there, it's um, finding the right treatment for you. I am trained in um, two forms of trauma therapy specifically. Um, so that's cognitive processing therapy, which is, um, it's based off of cognitive behavioral therapy. It's just tailored specifically to individuals with trauma. And then um, prolonged exposure therapy, which is, um, I don't use as much just because I give people a choice and they very rarely choose prolonged exposure. It's pretty gnarly. Um, it tends to work a little bit quicker, um, but it has the higher dropout rate because it is such uh, an intensely uncomfortable um, like with CPT, your discomfort is sort of spread out over a longer period of time. And with PE, prol prolonged exposure, you're just sort of like thrown into it um, pretty early on. Like we go over some skills at the beginning to help prepare you for it. But then it's really just putting you back in your memories over and over again until the body starts to learn that it's a memory and it's not a thing that's happening to you in the present. And I think, so there's other treatments. There's... Um, Eye movement, just EMDR. Mm -hmm. Yes, something reprocessing. I always forget what part of the acronym stands. I always forget the D. EMDR. Yeah. So I'm not. I'm not trained in EMDR. Um, the research has gotten better on it. Um, it's not been shown to be quite as effective as CPT or PE, but it is actually really effective for some people. Um, and if someone can't tolerate one of the two that I'm trained in, like I try and help them find somebody who can, um, who can do whatever treatment it is they think they need. And there's some, there's some other um, treatment options that are being researched more now too. There's also CBT specifically for, for trauma. There's um, a mindfulness approach. I typically am incorporating some elements of CBT and mindfulness, no matter which treatment option I'm doing. Um, but it's finding like the path that someone's willing to commit to because, um, and this is controversial. This is, I will throw this out. There's controversial for a therapist. I will not let a patient come and sit with me and just talk until they get to a point where they feel like they're ready to engage in trauma specific therapy. If trauma is the presenting issue and we're not working on something else also, if you have sleep issues that are, exacerbating your trauma or um anxiety related to public speaking fine whatever uh but um i won't let them take up my time in that way because the science doesn't really support that as being effective doesn't mean that that can't be a, a helpful experience for them and there are other services that do that if you need a space to just talk about things there are other services that do that in my role, my job is to help you specifically address the trauma. And so when you're ready to do that, and I will tell people, if you are not ready now, because this is really hard, this is going to be hard. That's fine. You can come back later. I don't judge you. I'm not, I'm not living your life right now. And I don't know what other factors this is going to complicate when we start unpacking all of this icky stuff. Yeah. Um, but I think really figuring out whether someone is at that place where they are ready to commit to a treatment because remember that avoidance piece is, is such a huge impediment sometimes to success and healing. Um, we want to make sure that someone's motivated enough or committed enough to it to push through mm -hmm. those, those elements of discomfort that might otherwise dissuade someone from proceeding with the treatment. So what can someone ask themselves in order to come to the conclusion that they are in fact ready to pursue treatment? I mean, I usually will, once we decide on it, whatever treatment that they're willing to, or that they're interested in. Um, so let's say CPT, for example, I will say like, okay, well, um, we don't, for CPT, you don't have to go over the 
the details, the vivid details of the trauma. We don't have to do that. We do have to talk about your beliefs about the trauma. Things like why it happened, what it means about you, what it means about the world, what it means about other people, and and try to figure out how maybe this trauma has affected those views. Um, And then we're going to have to talk about whether or not each of those thoughts actually is accurate. Does that make sense? You know, we're going to try and be a little bit more objective and step back and take in more of the information. And that's what I'm there for. Um, But it's a lot of homework. It's a lot of worksheets. And it's a lot of um, like the very first assignment they have is um, we call it an impact statement. So they have to go home and write about everything I just described, like why you think this trauma happened to you? um, How has it affected the way you think about yourself? How has it affected the way you think about intimacy and uh, esteem and the world in general and trust? And, um, And that assignment is really hard. And so I will describe all of this to them. Um, so it's also kind of part of my informed consent when we start a treatment. So I'm describing all of this to them. And then I will ask them, like, is that something that you are prepared to make yourself do? Right. Like I really make them think about how ugly it can be. Um, and so that they can decide, like, is that, am I going to be able to go home from work, drag out my trauma and then eat dinner with my family and get up and go to work again the next day. Right. Um, and so I think understanding what the treatment is, ask lots of questions, right? Um, and and I'm using, I work kind of from a medical model. So I'm using things like patient and treatment. Um, and that may not be the model that someone else is healing in. And that is totally fine. It does not make it any less valid. Um, but uh, kind of knowing what that path looks like um, and really considering how that impacts your day-to-day. Like, how is this going to impact my day-to-day? Do I have a space? Like, if you have a, if you go home and you have kids, the second you walk in the door, like, and especially if they're young kids, they're not going to respect, like, you know, dad needs a a half an hour to do, you know, dad's homework or whatever. They're not necessarily going to have the impulse control to respect that. And so, like, do you have a space where you can do this in private? Um, do you, you know, because I work with military a lot, like, are you leaving soon? I'm not going to start this treatment with you if you're transferring to a different duty station in the next, you know, month or you're getting ready to go on deployment. Um, because once I started, try and keep that momentum going because it is so hard. I want to hurry up and get you through the worst stuff so we can get to the part where it's hard, but you're also starting to see some of the payoff. Right. Um, so it's super long winded, but basically like really making sure you understand what will be expected of you in whatever treatment path that you take. Um, and I feel like that also goes hand in hand with choosing the right treatment for you. Um, the people that I recommend PE for the exposure therapy specifically. So some people just have a lot more physiological symptoms. They're not in their thoughts. Like they like we'll we'll talk through things and they don't really have a lot of those, we call them stuck points in CPT, like like a, a way of thinking about something that's kind of an impediment to your healing. Hmm. Um, and they don't have a lot of those, right? But like they jump at everything and they can't sit with their back to a door. And um, so those are gonna be the people that I'm more likely to recommend PE for because it's ro- reprogramming your body in a different way your mind in a different way. Um, but understanding that and understanding the options and figuring out like based off of the demands put on you day to day and based off of where you're at with your willingness and ability to talk about this stuff, which treatment do you feel like you can consistently show up for every day? Yeah. Cause you got to do it in between sessions, right? There's nothing magical about my office. Um, there's not, I wish there was, that'd be really cool. But you, it's just, I use the analogy a lot. Like if you hired a personal trainer and you met with them once a week, would you only work out that one time every week? And if you did, would you expect to see results? And most people can be like, no, of course not. And I'm like, it's the same thing with therapy. Like you got to do it. Like you got to do the stuff <laughs> in your life, not just in my office. Yeah. 
No, that's so good. And yeah, I do that with um, my clients on like, okay, if you really want to get support, you know, working with me, think of me as like your nutritionist. I'm going to help you get the abs, but I need you to see a therapist as well so they can help you with your endurance and they can give you the workouts. Like I'm going to give you the recipes and they're going to give you the workouts and you you need both of us in order to really live that joyful, fulfilled, thriver life. Um, and, and, and work through that. So yeah, I, I bring a gym, uh, <laughs> uh, analogy into, um, into my practice as well, but you hit on something super important, um, that I'd like to hit on before we kind of wrap up, which is, you know, you want to get them through things as quickly as possible so you can get them to the things where they're seeing the payoffs. Can you talk to us about what some of those payoffs are and what they look like? Like we talked about how hard it is. Now let's talk about why even do it in the first place and what is the thing that they're going to get out of treatment, whether they're working with you, with me, with, with anyone, what's the thing, what are some things that they can get out of it? Uh, Really what, so what a lot of people do to manage their traumatic experiences. Again, this goes back to the avoidance. They pack it tight. um, And then they're like, okay, great. I don't have to feel any of this. But the thing is when you pack away the uncomfortable feelings, it's not like selective. You don't get to just pack away the shame and the guilt and the anger and the sadness. You're also packing away um, curiosity, joy, calmness like you're you're kind of like shutting yourself off from all of your emotions and so I'll hear people say they feel really detached from their families people with children are like I know like I know I love them but like I don't I don't feel like I love them um and they won't really be enjoying their hobbies and like they they can often lead to depression too because it sort of creates this space where they have no quality of life. What you can usually start to expect to see with treatment, um, the first thing is you're going to start to see some of your thinking shift, most likely, right? Like the thing that scared you before is probably still going to initially scare you. And then you're going to a little bit more quickly process like, oh, not a real threat, right? Um, You're going to catch yourself cutting someone off because you don't think you can trust anybody right? You're going to catch that earlier and you're going to be able to make more deliberate choices mm-hmm. instead of just sort of the traumas like driving, driving the, the, the bus. Um, and then ultimately I want you to feel joy again. Like that's what I want you to get back in your life. Like you go to, um, a movie and you laugh, you feel present and you laugh and you bond with your partner about something or, um, you, sit on the floor with your kid and play with blocks, but you feel like really there and present. Um, That's what I expect people to start to be seeing. And, uh, you know, the protocols for these treatments are X number of weeks. Like for CBT, it's 12, I think. Um, Yeah, it's 12. And I always tell people too, like, you're not going to just be like, you're not going to have arrived (laughs) at 12 weeks, right? The goal is to get you better enough and we do maintenance like sessions we'll just like kind of start stretching it out right um so they're still getting some therapy but the goal is like for you to not need me anymore like for you to have the skill set to where you don't need a therapist your entire life like I should be putting myself out of a job um if I'm you know if I'm doing things correctly uh doesn't mean you may not need to come back to therapy at some point later in life when something else happens there's a new challenge but in general I'm wanting you to transition. I'm hoping to see you transition to being able to take the tools that we went over in therapy and just apply them on your own without, um, without a therapist. And that's going to look a lot of different ways, depending on what, what you're missing in your life because of your trauma. Yeah, that's so good. Um, and that's the thing that I, I, I tell my clients as well is like, I want you to not ever need me again. I want to say hi to you and then say goodbye to you. 
I want to get you to a place where you have the tools, you have the things. And if you need to come back for a tune up, awesome. If you need to, you know, but we're going to get to a place where, yeah, you, you don't need me for the long term. And then, yeah, potentially you need something else or you need to go talk to somebody else about something different that's happened in your life. Um, but life continues to go on and it's okay to be in and out of therapy your whole life. In fact, I think we should all have to have therapy from the time we're 12 until we're 30, like mandated that we need it. And then, you know, it's optional after that. But uh, being a preteen is hard. Being a teen is hard. Being a, a an adult and you're 18 to 20s, you're not an adult. I didn't feel like I was an adult until I was like 27. Um <laughs> You know, but then after that, there's so many things that that continue to happen. So I absolutely love that of, yeah, like let's put ourselves out of a job so everyone can just feel feel safe and comfortable. Um, absolutely amazing conversation. As we wrap up, I just have three last minute um, bonus round questions for you. How okay. does that feel? All right, let's do it. Okay. What are three things that have either helped you specifically in your own healing journey or three things that you find very helpful for um, your clients in their healing journeys? Uh, Mindfulness is number one. Like your mindfulness practice doesn't have to look like mine, but I think everybody should have some sort of mindfulness exercise that they're doing every single day. There's just, it's like a medication with no negative side effects. Like why would, we would all be taking it if it were a pill. Um, yeah, that's, yeah. Where's the lie? Um, can you give us just like a quick mindfulness, um, tool that we can use and then you can use the other, other two. Uh, yeah. So I think one of the ones I recommend for people who are just starting out is, is just slow breathing, which is also a great way to help manage trauma. Um, It's kind of the only way to hack our fight, flight, or freeze is to slow our breath because then that slows our heart rate. And so all you're doing, and you can look this up online, it's called box breathing. I think there's some other names for it, but it's really just you breathe in for, I usually do five seconds. And then I don't usually have people hold their breath anymore if I'm doing five seconds and then breathe out for seven seconds. So you just want this, you want the out breath to be a little bit longer than the in breath usually to um, slow that fight, flight, or freeze. And everybody may not be able to do five and seven, and that's okay. Uh, So a lot of times what I tell people to do, especially if you're starting this when you're feeling elevated already, start at whatever, start at whatever you need to start at that you can do reasonably, right? If it's three and five, then, you know, start there and try and slow your breathing down until you get to five and seven. I mean, if you just have an excellent um, lung capacity, you might need (laughs) to do to have them be even slower. Um, But that's where I tell beginners to start um, because it's so it's so accessible, right? You can do it anywhere. You don't need you can download guided box breathing, but you can also just do it. It's just counting and it has the added benefit of now you're counting. And so you can't be counting and as preoccupied as you were before with whatever thing you were stressing about or fixated on. Yeah. Love it. Oh, so good. Okay. The other two things that you have found helpful. Um, community. Uh, definitely community. And it took me, I talk, cause I see a lot of really young people, um, in my current practice. And so I, I empathize with them because I, it took me a long time. I was in my, like, late thirties before I really felt like I had a solid community. We talked about like the diversity of identity, but also kind of that diversity of social support. Um, if you have a great romantic partner, that's awesome. Um, definitely utilize them as a support, but, but having one person be everything to you in your social support, it's just a lot of weight on one relationship. Um, and so building building relationships where you can be authentic and vulnerable uh, is really important. And um, that's one thing that I know has made me significantly more resilient over the last several years. Amazing. And the last one. So number three, 
man, get your sleep straightened out. <laughs> like, <laughs> like it's just, everything is harder when you're not sleeping enough. Everything's harder. And, um, could I come up with something more profound? Absolutely. But, um, the bottom line is we need an adequate amount of sleep to function properly. And I know, um, like for myself, um, usually like working out in the mornings is a non-negotiable for me. Um, there's certain things that are non-negotiables, but if I have to choose between an exercise and getting eight hours of sleep, I will get the eight hours of sleep. If I'm having to make that choice all the time, I'm going to reevaluate what I'm doing with my priorities. Um, but I'm always going to choose rest just because the more I've learned about sleep and our brains and our bodies, the more I've realized that sleep is just pivotal in both our physical and mental health. And that that's hard because I know like some people are probably listening like, but my trauma is messing up my sleep. Yes, I know, I know, I know, I know. Um, but uh, pay attention to the sleep hygiene, right? Like your trauma is probably contributing to your sleep problems, but it may not be the only thing. And certainly we can make those things worse by, you know, we use a lot of coping skills that maybe make us feel better in the moment, but kind of cost us more in the long run. Um, so kind of getting familiar with sleep hygiene, learning about, you can just Google sleep hygiene and there's tons of information out there. Actually, I can provide you with the sleep hygiene handout too. So if that's something that you want to share with your listeners. Yeah. Grab that in the show notes that will be available for you there. Perfect. Sweet. Um, okay. Next question is what is the impact that you want to leave on the world? I feel like I'm, I'm leaving it now. Like I, I love what I am doing right now. Um, I feel like I'm getting to be present in people's lives in a way. And in my role right now, I also get to work with leaders um, and to be able to not just help individuals heal, but to help, I get to teach wellness. I get to teach things that make people more resilient. Um, and that's really, that's what I want to leave behind. Like I want people to, you know, every time someone comes into contact with me at work, um, I want them to feel seen and heard and I want them to feel like they matter, which is really hard because I don't have a front desk staff and sometimes I'm just trying to go pee in between patients, but, um, I, I want people to have some measure of, of resiliency or some more of a belief in their own ability to be resilient after interacting with me. I love that. That's so good. And yeah, you are leaving your impact right now. That's amazing. Okay. Where can thrivers and everyone else listening find out more about you online and how can they connect with you? Yeah. So, um, I don't have like a product that I'm offering to everybody, like a service, like I'm sure probably a lot of the people on your podcast do. Um, but I do have, um, a TikTok where I will just randomly when the mood strikes me, share something that came up in therapy that week that was, I think is relevant to a larger audience. Um, and, uh, that's probably the, if you just want the psychologist version of me, that is where to go. It's a uh, doc. I think it's Doc Pullman Turner. I'll make sure you have it. I don't remember the the full name, but I think it's Doc it Pullman Turner. Screen and it'll be in the show notes for everybody. Got it. Uh, and then I am also on Instagram if you um, want occasional psychology stuff and also random kung fu and, and lots of dogs. Um, you can follow me at cbog781 on Instagram. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, we talked about so many more things than we even planned to, and it was just absolutely perfect. So I really appreciate your time and your energy and just all of the wisdom that you provided today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Danielle. I enjoyed being here. Wow. That was incredible. Did you get as much out of listening to that as I did in creating it? I hope you did. I hope you found it helpful and powerful, and I hope that it allowed you to take action and choose yourself today. If you found this to be helpful, please share this with someone who needs to hear this message as well because we don't need to heal alone. Thank you so much for choosing yourself today and for listening. I'll see you next time.